to the question and answer session. In the description below, you can find BD's Big Book of Length. It essentially, it is my take on streamlined penis enlargement. It is everything that I've learned in the past six to eight months about applying physical therapy practices to the penis to maximize penis elongation. It is everything that my channel has covered and a lot of stuff that my Reddit has covered in a streamlined fashion, 110 pages of content for you, including routines and uh, diagrams and all that jazz. So if you want to get up to date and up to speed quickly, check out my book. Secondly, Leviathan Sups Vitality at LeviathanSups.com for a very good testosterone booster. Virilli, seminal volume fluid. Want to make a mess and impress? That's your thing. And then Vigor, really good for blood flow. For our purposes with penis enlargement, it should be self-explanatory why we want better blood flow. Now, paying out of the <laughs> now paying the bills is out of the way. Let's get into it. We're starting with Reddit first, and then I'll pick and choose some of the YouTube comments. All right, all right. Okay, where is this? -y? Okay, Campfire Crucifix ask. Seeing your techniques such as interval pumping, extending optimization of rest such as one day on and one day off and tunica release have only been implemented fairly recently he thinks it was in the past one to two years really it was in the past eight months from what everyone else has been doing such as a gel for youth under displays good looking loser do you think with the efficiency of the new methods of doing pe we could see a new slow but consistent max cap and length and girth over the next coming years from now, what it seems like with two years of dedication, about two inches is the max of what we've seen, which can be a little demotivating for below average users, whether that's from inefficiency of the old methods, inconsistency or just a max cap, it's still up in the air, not really. Um, <laughs> what are some realistic expectations that isn't a hyper responder in the course of a year? Um, he thinks it's an important topic to touch as some people might set unrealistic expectations in the short term, burn out when the goals aren't met, and end up quitting. That is completely correct. So let's first talk about this limit thing. I personally don't believe there's any like limit on paper on how big your penis can get. There are clearly practical limits though. First, partners will not want to take massive dicks unless they have a fetish for it. Secondly, um, there's the issue of pumping blood into the thing, and if it gets larger than, say, 10, 11, 12 inches, there's a slight chance your body will not be able to support it, especially if you're in poor cardiovascular health. So those are the two main caveats, but on paper, you can gain literally three, four, five inches, depending on how much time you put in, depending on what you want, and you need a little bit of luck to make sure you have the right, let's say higher than typical response to get those extreme sizes. But let's show you something real quick. Five inches, okay? Yeah, seven inches in a vacuum is pretty damn big. So this is gonna be six inches, all right? I'm a big guy, the penis still sticks out if this was a penis. So seven inches would be two hands. That is going to set most guys up for very high self-confidence and, you know, self-worth and all that. Um, there's going to be gentlemen like myself that want to get bigger, and that's fine. But the vast majority of guys do not really want to get gigantic. We do set very high standards for ourselves, but we don't really understand these high standards. For example, I just got in an argument with someone yesterday about him saying that seven and a half inches non-bone pressed was not gigantic. So let's see, it's this water bottle, seven and a half inches. This water bottle is just over seven and a half. It's about seven and three fourths. So a gentleman, that was larger than a one liter water bottle in length. It's not one liter. A gentleman larger than a typical water bottle was not huge by this man's standards. He's an idiot. 
<laughs> it's plain and simple. Most porn stars aren't even that big. So yeah, it, we need to actually talk about what's considered big first. And a lot of people think you got to have an eight inch dick, but that is literally a one in a thousand penis, statistically speaking. So if a tall guy is tall at above six foot, that is the 85th percentile for penis size. That's going to be about six and three fourths. Okay. If the average is about here, that's the difference. All right. Like to us porn warped minds, it does not seem that big, but I'm telling you, if you actually had a partner, I don't know how to word this, but I'm telling you that difference is significant. And that's only like, what, an inch, an inch and a quarter. So a lot of people will stop that soon once they realize how much their penis has changed in short order. That's literally a 20% different or increase in length. So that's one thing. But again, I still think people can get much larger than the two inches cap. The two inches cap is just made up right it's an arbitrary number you could say it's a one inch cap because most people stop at one inches uh one inches one inch you could say it is seven seven meters because of the averages and all that crap it's literally just a made-up number made up by some randoms that never gain more than an inch and a half they're like well this is obviously it but it, that's not the case um as for realistic expectations in your first year year jesus in your first year you can gain about an inch in length, give or take a quarter of an inch. So higher responders will gain about an inch and a quarter, and then lower end of the responders will gain three quarters of an inch following these newer methods that take rest into account. What happened in the old days is everyone would go gun ho with their new, say, phallus and forte, wear it for six to eight hours from the start, and they pack on size pretty quickly, would say like half an inch in three months, but because their tissues are chronically fatigued, they stop responding to the stimulus in a healthy manner and they start stagnating. So they get discouraged and they stop. You add in the bath mate, which is a very high pressure device and most people were using it wrong before me and Hank came along. And they would see stagnation there too. So really the moral of the story is, is with just an ounce of science we can overcome so many of the issues that plague PE beforehand and we can't let our insecurities get the best of us thinking that we need to be eight and a half nine inches to be considered huge or big or whatever and we need to stop letting those insecurities control how much work we do because it's always been more is more not adequate is adequate <laughs> and like just speaking from my experience just outside of penis enlargement I switched my workouts around and I've added like two days off a week and I've gained three pounds of muscle mass since I started adding days off because I'm allowing my central nervous system to recover. It's really that simple. Penis and muscle are not the same thing, but your body needs time to recover. That's one of the global rules of biology. Rest to heal. Dependent Road 3610. Do you think it's plausible that there are two ways of growing, collagen fatigue or tissue degradation with heavy hanging and extending. Mitosis with low tension ADS work and combining both methods could synergistically yield better results or is meiotic activity off the charts in your point of view? If so, why? Okay, let's switch to me. All right, so for context, mitosis is the division of cells. So the old idea with extenders is that if you constantly pull on the ex tissues the cells will start to divide which is true to an certain extent except we are not really dealing with just tissues we are predominantly dealing with collagen fibrils now these collagen fibrils are connected to something called collagen fibroblasts and those are the cells that make collagen but they Collagen is just a molecule, and that therefore they don't follow the same rules of mitosis as a cell would. They do hyperplasia, they do um, some hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is the division of these, per or the creation of more tissue in general. Hypertrophy is the increasing the size of existing tissue. So those are the two main pathways for 
soft tissue growth in our case. Now, the endothelial tissue will see more mitosis as endothelial cells line the penis, the corpus cavernosum, and all that jazz. So that's where we'll see mitosis, but that's going to be with pumping and BFR. So that's different. So for length purposes, we do not care about mitosis. What we care about is growth factor release because that's what's going to cause um, the transcription of collagen proteins and a bit of elastin, as Hank likes to point out. <laughs> but anyway, um, so we need to focus on secreting as much growth factor as possible in collagen fatigue to generate as many collagen proteins and elastin proteins as possible. Let's see, am I missing anything? So, <sighs> there's no point of mixing all day stretchers and heavy hanging and extending. It depends on your definition of heavy. Again, I don't think there's a purpose of going beyond 10 to 15 pounds with hanging. And it really depends on the device. If you're vacuum hanging 10 pounds, if you're compression hanging no more than 15, foot play around with your set times and other forms of stimulus before you change your weight. Um, as for all day stretchers, they're really not worth it. You actually need to be under tension and be under significant tension. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable to be wearing it for three to four hours a day, especially in the office. You might be walking with a bit of a limp and it might be noticeable. All day stretchers like the Fallison Forte are out of necessity, not out of efficiency. Okay. Come on computer. Work with me. My motherboard is having USB issues. So my mouse does not like to go where I want it to go. And I'm gonna have to replace this motherboard. Isn't that fun? Okay. Neff Uness, please talk about if the interval length protocol, you must be Canadian, high tension extending is beneficial for beginners and if so, we should only do it for four days a week or more because we are beginners. Okay, please computer work with me, okay. Beginners, inner length protocol is fine. That's literally the backbone of my book, the interval length protocol, and I have beginners starting off with it. Um, however, you're gonna need significantly less than us because you're going to be easily stressed. I still say 10 minutes fatigue sets, but you need two strain sets. So the 10 one minute sets at the beginning and then two five minute sets at the end. And then every three weeks you add a set until you hit about, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 minutes under tension to maximize gains. If your interval extending, you gotta be careful with the amount of tension, especially with the apex, because it's a very high powered device. I love the thing, but if you don't know what you're capable of doing, you really gotta start slow with it. Um, and that being said, I rarely go above 10 pounds. A beginner, three to five max. Rest should be the same for uh, beginners, four days a week, just because we are trying to maximize recovery. Yeah, that's about it for that question. Uh, let's see. Thoughts on all day pumping <laughs> marathons, like eight hours at one to two HG for ex healing expanded. That's not going to work. Uh, what happens is the sensor penis is not going to be erect for eight hours and one to two HG is not enough to mimic an erection. You'll just get a bunch of subcutaneous edema under the skin. So you get a nice fat flaccid, but it's just filled with water under the skin. I can achieve this in like two hours of two uh, inches of mercury of pressure flaccid. I've done it before because that's what some of the old forms. I've literally tried everything. If I thought it was worth a damn, I would have wrote about it by now. <laughs> okay. Um, healing in an expanded state, there's no scientific evidence for it. And if anything, there's a chance that causing this much inflammation and not letting it drain is going to negatively impact gains in the future because we're going to cause a bit of Fibrosis build up from the lack of oxygen, lack of nutrients getting to the damaged tissues, fatigued tissues. Um, so yeah, don't do it unless you have a fetish for having a nasty ass, not nasty, for having a nice spongy blobby penis. Additional aid 2406, best simple straightforward routine if you own an apex extender and a pump in which order to do it, how long, etc. Okay, this is really one of the only places me and Perp differ. 
I say pump after because there's a slightly higher risk of blisters with pumping before using your length device. Perv likes a bit of the inflammation and fatigue generated from pumping before he goes in. So it's really up to you what you want to do. There's really no difference except for a little bit of risk prevention and a little bit more fatigue generated. It's really what you're comfortable with. Uh, simple routine. Again, it's just the interval length protocol. Like, I've written this out. I do not make this more difficult than it needs to be, guys. So, 10 one a minute sets of fatigue. Uh, depends on your level. Uh, let's say four to six levels of strain sets. So, five minute sets. We're looking at 40 minutes in the apex. If I was going to do this, I would get interval pumping two sets five minutes right after my sessions. And then if I really was serious about this, I would add in uh, tunica release stuff. So BFR massage, tunica shears, um, gua sha scrapes, or one of the two, you know, because they're different exercises actually. And then I already said BFR massage, but yeah, that's really it. You can do massage under tension too. That's very nice for you intermediates. The routine should not take you more than 50 minutes to 60 minutes. When you add the pumping in, it should only take 60 minutes total. If you're trying to make it stupid simple, this little device will make your interval pumping much easier. I just ordered 50 of these, they'll be here in three weeks. But essentially, you can set the pressure and how long you want it to cycle. So if you set it for, uh, in this case, 20 kilopascals, and then pump intervals of two minutes, you can do automated interval pumping. It is fantastic. I've done it three times already. Um, the results have been much more efficient because there's a lot less human error with the pumping. So when that comes out, I'll let you all know. They'll probably fly off the shelves like hotcakes. Anyway, that's what I would do. I'd switch to apex extending interval pumping, preferably with an electric pump here, and then go from there. I would like to know more about rust. You mentioned something in a previous video about an experiment where cells exposed to growth factor being desensitized and slow to growth or something like that. I am one year in with five to six days a week of pumping. I'm thinking less is more at this point. Okay, so yeah, less is more, and we have like proof for it, right? That's the difference between uh, a lot of the old stuff is that it's just a lot of hearsay and speculation, and then some people just applied material sciences rather than biological sciences to biology, and we're expecting to get consistent results with it. Um, so the idea is, is that since we're dealing with biological tissues, we have a practical limit of how much force and stress we can apply to it before we have negative tissue adaptation. Therefore, we need ample rest to avoid negative tissue adaptation. With pumping, every other day is probably plenty. There is evidence to say that literally every two days might be optimal for you depending on your own growth cycle or growth hormone release cycle, growth factor release cycle more accurately. So you got to play around with it, but five to six days a week is going to be pushing it in most cases. Um, just real quick on the less is more. It's not even so much that less is more. It is more like accurate work is correct. Since we have metrics now that we can track with fatigue rate and strain rate, we know exactly how much work we need to do almost every session. And based off of our fatigue rate, we know we can when we need to take a long-term break. With old school methods, and why I am pretty much against them, is that we have no idea what rate of strain we need to hit. We have no idea how long our sessions need to be. So a lot of people erred on the side of caution that more work, more time, more pressure is going to lead to better results. But that's counter intuitive well i guess it's not really counterintuitive but that's just not how our body works when we look at the research so yeah rest is king adequate work is king um less is not necessarily more smart design of routines is king stump pumping mug womp <laughs> Okay, the new GERF routine is absolute king shit. I'm assuming that's a compliment, so thank you. Thoughts on soft clamping 
afterwards two sets of 10 minutes i can keep adding sets up to fatigue how many max so this is what we just talked about we do not need to add more if we're already hitting our growth metrics so if we're already hitting six to eight percent expansion after our growth sessions we do not need to add more clamping is not very efficient in expansion to begin with so we need to pick and choose our exercises based off of what they're best at. So if we're trying to expand more, we wanna actually add more sets of pumping. And if we're trying to, let's say, increase erection density and erection quality, clamping is gonna be best for that. So what I recommend is if you're not hitting your pumping metrics with this routine, add in more pumping sets. And then if you want to slightly boost the efficiency of your routine every other session so like four days every four days you want to do one 10 minute sets of bfr clamping not traditional clamping bfr clamping so that is one 10 minute set you keep in erection you stint off all blood flow for 10 minutes release whole bunch of growth factors will be released increasing angiogenic activity of the corpus cavernosum filling out the new tunica albuginia tissue therefore you'll have thicker erections outside of the uh cylinder without uh overly exhausting the tissue for fatigue sets and a stentor extentor for fatigue sets in an extender ask usual initial 9307 is do i recommend working up to your target weight or just do the sets at your target weight just fine so what I do is I set five minutes, five minutes. What I do is I set my target tension, but since it's going to take, you're going to elongate almost immediately once you put the device on, you have to adjust the tension set by set. And that's what I do. I might start a little bit lower because the stretch is too intense to start, but in theory, you don't need to like do a warm up, especially if you do all the fatigue, uh, tunica release stuff beforehand, because that's really your practical warm up. Um, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> um, I always adjust the tension to make sure I'm at constantly at seven to ten pounds of tension. Newbies, you're going to start lower. All right, I think we're on to the YouTube questions. Doop, doop, doop. John Lennon has two questions. How long would you say your current routine approach compare from a few years ago? Would you have gained more without a doubt? Um, do you still recommend a three week break after a few months as in regards to strength adaptation? All right, well, three years ago, I was just getting back into PE. I was going to do uh, pyramid hanging. So that's like I would work up to 12 pounds compression hanging and then slowly increase the weight and slowly decrease the weight. There's evidence that still is useful, but like based off of my research, it's not necessary. Um, and then it would have been a shit ton of pumping of a bath mate. Yeah, uh, needless to say, my routines have changed so much since then. So, I'm just trying to think. Back when I first started up again, I gained maybe a quarter of an inch in six months. When I switched back to, or when I switched to my new stuff after a bit of a break, I gained half an inch in four to five months. So the proof is in the pudding that the older methods compared to my newer methods, light and day difference. We're talking double as efficient. So yes, if I had time, I would have destroyed any of my previous records because right now I just restarted PE for the third time. I had to take six weeks off due to business reasons just because I couldn't fit into my damn schedule. But if I was able to stick with it, I would be much, well, not much larger, but a good bit larger than I am now. Right now I'm about eight and a half by 6.1 mid shaft, seven base for those that don't really pay attention. Do I still recommend three day, we, we, uh, 
Do I still recommend three week breaks after a few months? Um, on paper, yes, just because it's nice to reset your brain. You're not going to lose size. If you lose a significant amount of size in three weeks, you never actually gained. So and if you old heads that are saying it's too long, I lost size, well, guess what? You never gained. If you do this right, you should actually see about a 16th to an eighth of an inch growth in that time period. Me and Hank, I've done this many a times at this point. We would see about a 16th to an eighth of an inch change in our months off in length. We might lose a smidge of girth as we can, um, the tuna get, gets more stiff, therefore it's harder to push out against, but that collagen is then pushed forward instead of outward and therefore you're a little bit longer. It's pretty cool, but yeah. Um, now, per threw a wrench in this as he says, I have never taken an extended break and I have gained two and a quarter of inches in a very short period of time. So there are gonna be some of you out there that will not have to worry about this. But Perf has also started doing this very methodically, very, um, I guess you can say anti-progressive overload. The way he constantly gained is that he constantly changed the stimulus. So we're on the interval length protocol now. He was, I can't remember exactly what he was doing, but it was, I think, akin to the 1-3 protocol or something similar to interval length protocol without even really thinking about it as that's what I was doing as well. Me and Perver were like, kind of like telepathically linked in the back of our head. It's really weird. But <laughs> when it comes down to it, err on the side of caution, take the three week break off. Worst case scenario is that you just get super sensitive again for sex, right? <laughs> um, moving on. Protocols to get a bigger glands. Vacuuming raw and forms of clamping of her glands extenders really talk about growing glands as except the ones that are easy to do. If it's easy to do, why don't we add something to our routines to make it bigger as it might be the easiest way to gain size and girth. <sighs> um, so, <laughs> in my experience, my glands just grew super fast without any direct work. So that was with just vacuum hanging raw, clamping and pumping. I would say clamping had a significant effect over pumping, however, and vacuum hanging had the biggest effect. So if you really want to target your glands for whatever reason, just like two to three pounds of weight for an hour with a very large vacuum bell. Not very large, but you know, significantly larger than what you are now. And that's just going to make your glands really big. Since it is not limited by the tunica albuginea, it grows super fast compared to the rest of the penis. And that's why we don't target it because we could just have this huge apple head and then have a really tiny shaft and it would be kind of look like a lollipop. And I've actually seen pictures of guys with something like that. Don't ask me why, I, I'm a degenerate before 2022. So, um, K, GK the Great, from seven inches, how long would you expect to get to one or 8.6 with the slowest grading rate? Well, I don't like, and that'd be like impossible to say because the slowest gain rate's technically logarithmic, right? So you could be gaining literally a cell a month right <laughs> or a new protein a month and still technically be gaining so typically an inch and a half takes about 18 months slow responders a typical slow responder would take two to three years that being said with all this new stuff who knows how long it actually takes now <laughs> because if we extrapolate out from my response from the interval link protocol and tunica release an inch and a half would take less than a year Granted, I was not able to pull that off because of work constraints and all that, but like on paper, that's what we're dealing with. What are your thoughts on fat or androphil injections specifically for girth and length? Okay. Now, I don't necessarily, I definitely don't condone fat transfers to the penis. And this is because you can get something called fat embolism. That fat becomes like a blood clot and then kills you. So don't do fat transfers. It's probably the most risky procedure for penis enhancement. Um, fillers, I'm not sure which one androphil is. I think that's hyaluronic acid. Uh, it's temporary. And I mean, it's 
it's benign, but out of all the people that I've coached, the two most difficult cookies to crack have been the ones that got in fillers. So like they wanted more length, but since they had filler or filler removed, it's been next to impossible to get them to grow because it's so easily to stress out these tissues. So easy to stress out these tissues. So that's what I've learned with this is that you do not want to add filler until you're at your goal length. And that's kind of what fallow board says too. Um, so please don't do fillers until you know you're the length you want to be. Uh, permanency. I've seen more, I've seen better results with something called PMMA and it's, some people just call it Bellafill now, but essentially it's just like a silicone filler and that's much more long-term than hyaluronic acid. So if you want to go that route, I would go more towards PMMA with a good practitioner rather than hyaluronic acid as they're both about the same price. It's just hyaluronic acid will only last about a year, year to 18 months before you need a refill. Will E. Liss 3278 is avoiding strength adaptation more important than progressive overload? Uh, depends on your school of thought. So contrary to popular belief, and I think I've probably mis, um, led you guys a bit. Strength adaptation is very slow with connective tissues, particularly non-tendon and ligament connective tissues. So our penis really won't see that much change in strength year to year. Um, unless you train specifically with progressive overload in mind. That's why some people can hang 20, 40 pounds off their penis without really seeing a change. But on paper, we're talking like a fifth of the strength adaptation of muscle. So it's very slow is what I'm trying to say. Uh, what we're really trying to avoid is stress hardening. And stress hardening is when we do stress out the tissue so much with these high weights that it makes it harder and harder to gain. And it's gonna take a lot more work to reverse this stress hardening than it is just to take the time off to make sure we don't have any overwork symptoms. And then we need to avoid uh, growth factor fatigue. And that's what's really going to cause true stagnation. So. You can do a bit of progressive overload, but I really don't think once you get to about seven to 10 pounds of tension or seven to 10 HG of pumping, you know, internal pressure, there is no reason to go beyond those metrics. And like all you'd have to do at that point is add more time to get to not stress harden. And um, even then there'd be a point where it's just going to be too much work to reasonably do in one day. And that's why I'm I'm such a big proponent of rest because then when we come back, we need less time and potentially less weight to get the same, if not better results. Okay, why do you prefer straight out stretches in the new routines? Okay, so it's not that I don't think between the cheeks and straight down stretches aren't worth it. It's because I wanted something that was just um, very straightforward and very scientifically backed. There is no um, evidence that the way you stretch your penis will change the stress adaptation. On top of that, if we're trying to target the ligament, there's no like medical or scientific evidence that elongating or severing the suspensory ligament causes changes in size or usable length. So if you are very skeptic you'd want to stick to like the tried and true traction therapies. And if we're trying to just mimic that with our hands, we want to do straight out straight down is fine as well. But between the cheeks, that's more fringe stuff when we're talking about this from a scientific perspective. That being said, I still recommend most people do some form of between the cheek stretching or ligament emphasis. But since I'm trying to be more scientifically sound than most of my contemporaries outside of my podcast group, um, that's why I foregoed the other angles stretching. And then finally, breaking girth plateaus. Simply put, take a break, add tunica release. So 
so you know a bunch of stuff to make it easier to expand make sure you're hitting your expansion metrics and make sure you're not overusing your penis meaning you're masturbating too much potentially having too much sex and then making sure that your uh sleep diet and everything else anything that could be limiting healing is taken care of as well all right i have no idea how long this is so we are going to call it a day i actually got through every question i don't know how well this is going to be edited either but let me know what you think uh, again bd's big book of length is in the pinned comment and description below leviathan sups for best bang for your buck stimulant free pre-workout testosterone booster and seminal volume booster and more to come soon hink and i are just trying to work out the details but yeah this is BD signing off.